Welcome on board this lecture on the carbon impact of air travel. After a short introduction, I'm going to explain the carbon impact of airplane flights before the carbon impact of passengers traveling by air. Then I will present a few benchmarks so that it makes sense. We'll finish with solutions. Of course, they depend on the way you ask questions. In case of emergency, the pause key will give you a little oxygen before you press start again. We're going to take off, so please fasten your seat belts. Here are the flights on this extract of a video published by the NASA in 2017. If you are looking for information about air travel, you can read 3.68 liters per passenger per 100 kilometers, and that sounds good because a small car consumes 3 to 4 liters of fuel for 100 kilometers. But if you imagine that an aircraft which takes off burns as much fuel as your car will ever burn, it doesn't sound so good. When you read about fuel efficiency reductions of 70%, it seems good. But then you may read about airlines being compared to coal, and coal has a bad climate reputation. So it doesn't seem good. And for a given flight, you may find highly variable figures, for example, ranging from 46 to 300 kilograms of CO2 for a flight from Paris to Quimper. This is puzzling. During this lecture, I will clarify all these statements. So what's carbon impact? It's the impact on global warming. It can be either a warming up impact or in some cases a cooling down impact. Carbon dioxide or CO2 emissions have the effect of warming up the global temperature. The emission of other greenhouse gases also have this impact. And there are other sources of warming. You'll get an idea about them on slide 10. Be aware that carbon impact differs from pollution, which is more of a local problem and has negative impacts on health. Now let's turn to the flight. Of course you think about the aircraft flying, the cruise phase. But what about the climb and the descent? Usually, cruise emissions include everything over 3,000 feet, the LTO, which stands for landing and takeoff cycle, includes the final approach, landing, taxiing in, and before taxiing out, take off and climb out. So the emissions of the LTO cycle are part of flight emissions. What about the upstream emissions of fuel? Emissions resulting from the production and distribution of fuel? They are often excluded from the data you read about flights. What about the airport activities or the trips of the travelers to and from the airport? These emissions are most often excluded. What about the making of the aircraft? That emits greenhouse gases, and some share of these emissions should be allocated to each of the flights. But I've never seen these emissions included in flight CO2 figures. Yet the prices of air tickets include some share of the cost of the making of the aircraft. So you understand that the scope can be a narrow scope if we consider only the flight or a much broader scope. Now, how can we calculate the CO2 emissions of a flight? We can start with the amount of fuel burned, how many liters, for example. Emission factors have been calculated, indicating how many kilograms of CO2 are emitted per liter of fuel burnt, with or without upstream emissions. 
Here is the Fuelist Jet A1, a common aviation fuel based on kerosene. The amount of CO2 emitted equals the fuel amount multiplied by the emission factor. Also note the grey figures which you can use for a car. For example, if you drive 200 km with a car consuming 5 liters per 100 km, you will burn 2 times 5, so 10 liters of fuel. The emission factor, including upstream emissions, is about 3 kg of CO2 per liter of fuel. This will result in about 3 times 10, so 30 kg of CO2. Note that if you fly, after a landing, you can ask the staff how much fuel was burned. You'll probably get an answer in tons, not liters, because the way is what matters most for an aircraft. Here is a picture of what typically happens during one hour of a flight with 150 passengers. 2.7 tons of kerosene are burned. 8.5 tons of CO2 are emitted. What can we deduce from those two figures? Press pause and try to find the answer. The answer is we can find out what is the corresponding emission factor with or without upstream emissions. Just divide the CO2 kilograms by the liters of fuel. Be careful, fuel floats on water, the density is about 0.8. So the number of liters is more than the number of kilograms. The result is 2.5 kilograms of CO2 per liter. This does not include upstream emissions. It's just, as expected from the picture, what flows out of the turbine. Upstream emissions take place before the flight and somewhere else. Maybe you're asking yourself, why is it heavier after than before? How does one liter of fuel turn into about 2.5 kilograms of CO2? Press pause and try to find the answer. The answer is, it's because combustion also consumes dioxygen. Carbon linked with oxygen atoms in CO2 molecules results in a higher mass than when carbon was combined with light hydrogen atoms in the hydrocarbon molecules forming fuel. Note that pollutants are also emitted, and by the way, water vapor is also emitted, resulting in contrails, otherwise known as condensation trails. CO2 emissions based on bottom-up methods, starting from flights before aggregating flight data, tend to produce underestimates of global aviation emissions because they often consider ideal flights. But real distances are not ideal. There is time spent waiting, either in the air before landing or on the ground before taking off and non-commercial aviation also emits CO2. CO2 emissions can also be calculated using top-down methods based on total aviation fuel sales and breakdowns until you get the emissions of a flight. CO2 emissions are only part of the impact of flights on climate change. Beyond CO2, the topic is complex because of non-linear and non-additive impacts resulting in large uncertainties, especially regarding contrails and cloudiness. Now let's come back to one of the statements from slide 4. A Boeing 747 taking off consumes as much fuel as a Clio, a small car, during its entire lifetime. Let's find out if that's true or false. The fuel consumption of the car ranges from 3.5 to 5 or more liters per 100 kilometers. Its lifetime is at least 100,000 kilometers, 
it could be 200,000 kilometers or even more. So its lifetime fuel consumption can vary from 3,500 liters to more than 10,000 liters. A Boeing 747 consumes up to 4,500 liters during its LTO cycle. So one can say that the LTO cycle of a 747, rather than just taking off, burns as much fuel as this small car, but only if the fuel consumption of the car is low and if it has a short lifetime. Moreover, the LTO fuel consumption of other Boeing aircrafts and of comparable Airbus aircrafts based on flight data are much smaller. So the comparison is sort of choosing the aircraft with the biggest LTO consumption. So true or false? I let you make your own decision on the answer. What are the take-home messages of this chapter? A flight from taking off to landing and including taxiing emits CO2 from less than one ton to hundreds of tons. There are other warming impacts during the flight and apart from the flight. Additionally to this carbon impact, there are other non-carbon impacts, such as pollution or resource depletion. These impacts are out of the topic of this lecture. Of course, the more energy efficiency increases, the less CO2 is emitted during the flight, the less other impacts can be neglected. Now it's time for a break and you may offer yourself a drink. We're flying at a speed of 100 words per minute and the weather is fine. When you're ready, let's go on. Let's go on, yes. Because once you know the carbon impact of a flight, you have to allocate this impact to the passengers to get the impact of air travel. Here is an example of an Airbus A320. 29 rows of 6 seats, so 174 seats, you can check. So you could say the carbon impact of a passenger is the carbon impact of the flight divided by 174 if all the seats are occupied. But some seats may be empty, in this case passenger carbon impact will be higher. A basic allocation rule divides the carbon impact of the flight by the number of passengers. Now let's have a look at another A320. You could expect 165 seats, but you will count 148 seats. 114 economy seats and only 34 business seats because there are 17 empty spaces between two seats. If you consider that the carbon impact should be allocated according to the space, the carbon impact of these business seats is 1.5 times the impact of economy seats. Not more or not much more because the distance between rows is the same for the two classes, at least from what I could measure. Now, let's have a look at this A350. There are 324 seats. You can count 266 economy seats, 24 premium seats and 34 business seats. Do these take more space? Inside the two identical red rectangles, I counted 21 business seats and 63 economy seats, so the floor space ratio is about 3. If you decide to allocate the carbon impact according to the space occupied by the passengers, then the carbon impact will be about 3 times higher for business tickets 
But it's not just a matter of space. Premium or business classes may allow more luggage and the passenger load factor may be lower in these classes. So space allocation is not the only allocation rule to consider. You could even decide to allocate the carbon impact of the flight according to the ticket prices. Because what makes plane fly is not the space you take up on the cabin floor. It's the money you give the airline. In this case, the difference between classes would increase and if it became the standard allocation rule, some organizations would increase the share of economy tickets to reduce their impact and the financial equilibrium of airlines would be at risk. What about freight? There are cargo freighters dedicated to freight transport, but some aircrafts transport both passengers and freight. One usual allocation rule between passengers and freight is a mass allocation considering 50 kg per seat and 100 kg per passenger. The result is a global share of nearly 20% for freight operations and 80% for passengers. So what are the global results? On average, it's 88 grams of CO2 per RPK. What's that? One RPK is one passenger generating revenue by paying for his seat and flying one kilometer. But what sources of global warming does this include? If you read the source document, you'll find the emission factor is 3.16 tons of CO2 per ton of fuel. That is to say, 2.5 kilograms of CO2 per liter of fuel using a density of 0 0.8. This only includes CO2 emissions during the flight as seen on slide 7. Now have a look at the red curve. It represents, by flight distance, the carbon intensity, that is to say the CO2 emissions per RPK. It's high for short distance flights because of the fuel consumption of the LTO cycle. 155 grams of CO2 per passenger and per kilometer. There is a minimum around 3,000 kilometers, about 75 grams of CO2 per passenger and per kilometer. For longer distances, the emissions per passenger and per kilometer slowly increase because you need a lot of fuel to fly long distances and the fuel weigh reduces the whole flight performance. The carbon intensity is then about 90 grams of CO2 per RPK. In the beginning, I suggested that the information on the carbon impact of traveling here from Paris to Quimper, a bit less than 500 kilometers, depends on the source. Very low results are displayed by the online calculator of the International Civil Aviation Organization, pronounced ICAO. But there is a problem with the method. I will explain that in the next slide. Airlines, like Air France, usually only report CO2 emissions during the flight. This produces low results, making the impact look as small as possible. And the class is not mentioned on the calculator webpage. Atmosphere and My Climate offer carbon offsetting services. I will detail this in the next chapter. They tend to count as broadly as they can so that your impact is not underestimated and in the way they get more money from your offsetting. This gives much higher results depending on methods detailed on their websites. This, roughly speaking, doubles the impact. But this doubling is presently being discussed as the factor reflecting present warming from past emissions, which was the primary source of information, 
is not simply the same as the factor which should be applied to future warming from present emissions. Where does my own value come from? Well, during the flight I counted the number of seats and the number of occupied seats. And after landing, I asked the staff how much fuel was burned during the flight. You can do this as well. I got tons, converted them into liters and then into CO2 emissions per passenger, added upstream emissions and non-CO2 impact, supposing they double the flight CO2 emissions, like my climate. So I got nearly 300 kilograms of CO2. Why so much? Well, for a given pair of cities, the variability among the flights is high. My value is not representative of the average value of this pair of cities. It so happens that my last flight in 2011 was not crowded at all. For a round trip from Paris to New York, results are here expressed as tons, not kilograms. They are also highly variable, especially when you consider the class. Let's now examine the IKO methodology and its often low results. I must warn you, it's the most difficult slide of this lecture. Firstly, the passenger share of flight emissions is calculated in order to exclude the freight emissions. OK. Then, an impact per economy passenger is calculated, dividing this passenger emissions by by the following factor. What's that? The number of Y seats is the maximum number of economy seats that can be fitted into the aircraft. It comes from documents from aircraft manufacturers. The PAX load factor is the number of passengers transported divided by the number of seats available for passengers. It's different from the maximum number of economy seats because the airlines often use less densely packed configurations than the maximum and sometimes there are not only economy seats. For premium seats, a class correction factor doubling the impact is then applied to this impact per economy passenger but only for flight distances over 3,000 kilometers. So the results are underestimated if the seat density is lower than the maximum and still more under 3,000 kilometers if there are premium seats taking more space. Note that the results only account for CO2 emissions during the flight. What are the take-home messages from this chapter? The information you get about the carbon impact of air travel is highly variable. It depends on the class, the sources of impact and the scope, namely only CO2 during the flight or also other climate impacts, the aircraft, the load factor, etc. An easy to remember value could be 100 grams of CO2 per passenger and per kilometer. It may be less easy to remember that it accounts for the CO2 emissions during the flight 88 grams of CO2 per passenger and per kilometer, the fuel upstream emissions plus 21%, no other warming impact, and is valid only for economy seats and not for short distances. Let's now have another break before we enter a zone of turbulence. I'm sorry to say it could make you sick. When you're ready, 
fasten your seat belts and let's go on. Warning! Always ask yourself what's in and what's out or excluded from the data. So, which sources are included? Only CO2 or also other warming impacts? What's the scope? Only the flight or also upstream emissions or more? And a new question will arise. Is international aviation included? Kyoto basket means that international aviation is out of the data. Why? Well, imagine an Irish passenger flying from Paris to Rome with the German airline Lufthansa. Which allocation rule should be used for these emissions of international aviation? This issue has been widely debated because, of course, no country wants these emissions in its basket. Should the emissions be allocated to Ireland because the passenger comes from Ireland or France or Italy, the countries of departure and destination? Or Germany, because Lufthansa is a German airline. I'm not going to detail all the allocation rules that could be applied. The winner for the widely used Kyoto basket was no allocation to any country. <laughs> On a global scale, 2% of carbon emissions could seem low to some. But, although it includes freight, the only source of warming is CO2. The scope is limited to the flight. And 62% of the emissions of air travel comes from flights taking off high-income countries, representing only 16% of the world population. So, let's examine one of these countries. Let's benchmark air transport against the total greenhouse gas emissions for France. In 2017, 465 million tonnes of CO2 equivalent were emitted, excluding land use related impacts. Note that CO2 equivalent is often used when other greenhouse gases, for example methane from agriculture, are converted into their equivalent CO2 impact for a given period of time, usually 100 years. Transport emitted 135 million tons of CO2. Regarding air transport, named here Aérien, you can read 3.7% of transport emissions, including freight. So 5.1 million tons of CO2 equivalent which would be about 1% of total emissions. Yes, but... It so happens that there is a footnote, not under this chart, but under the previous table, displaying the figures for this chart on the previous page. It means that international transport is not included. In another document, you may find the missing figure. 17.5 million tons of CO2, so you get 22.5 million tons of CO2 for air transport, between 4 and 5% of emissions. And if you read the document carefully, you may discover that this includes half of the flights. In order to avoid double counting, when adding the data from different countries. This means that only half of the emissions of a flight from France to Africa are counted as French emissions. This rule moves emissions from countries where people fly more towards countries where people fly less. So emissions induced by French travellers are probably higher. Additionally, it doesn't include the other legs if the passengers fly from one place to another. <laughs>
And on top of that, it's only CO2, excluding other warming sources, and the scope is minimal. Well, let's estimate the impact differently. Start from 22.5 million tons of CO2, add non-CO2 impacts, about as much, and compare it to the 2050 climate target, 75% less than 1990. You get more than 30%. Remove freight, but use consumption-based allocation rules, and broaden the scope, it could be still more. A residence-based allocation has been used in Sweden for air travel and taking into account non-CO2 impacts produce results similar to that of cars. It's a bit annoying to notice that the figures you uncover increase as you go along until you get an idea of the impact compared to sustainable targets which should be one of the key public indicators of national and international carbon management. Now let's have a look at airlines. At first, add these ads by Ryanair in 2019. They were banned by the Advertising Standards Authority in the UK. Why? Let's first come back to slide 4. An efficiency record is put forward, 3.68 litres per passenger per 100 kilometres. This claim was made by the Lufthansa Group in 2017. Let's multiply by the combustion emission factor without upstream emissions, 2.54. It turns into 93 grams of CO2 per passenger and per kilometre. The ad by Ryanair displays 66 grams of CO2 per RPK. As I mentioned previously on slide 20, the global average is 88 grams of CO2 per RPK. By the way, the Concorde aircraft had the quite high fuel consumption of 17 liters per passenger per 100 kilometers when flying from Paris to New York. So yes, Ryanair has a low carbon ratio. But what if you decide not to consider ratios but total emissions? Do you remember this? Ryanair is the new coal. This was a statement by a manager of an environmental NGO about climate because Ryanair entered the top 10 EU CO2 emitters in 2018, and most top 10 emitters are big plants burning coal. Additionally, Ryanair, in light blue, contributes to the growth of EU aviation emissions. This explains the ban on low carbon ads. Of course, if the growth of air travel emissions outweighs the decrease of emissions per passenger and per kilometer, then the global impact is worse. Now, let's benchmark greenhouse gas emissions on scales indicating climate-compatible values. Of course, this will depend on the maximum warming you consider, either 1.5 degrees Celsius or 2 degrees Celsius, and on the probability of us staying under that limit, which is itself not always explicit, usually 50 or 66%. It depends on your time horizon, often 2050 or 2030. In the past, we often read about annual emission budgets until 2050. This was based on hypothesis of a linear decrease of emissions, and this is not what happened. So now we tend to read about remaining carbon budgets. And the more we are over this budget, the more the remaining budget decreases, resulting in recent estimations producing lower emission targets than older ones. 
What about a round trip from Paris to Marrakech in economy class? Using the atmosphere calculator, its climate impact is 882 kilograms of CO2. Is it climate compatible? Based on a report by the German Advisory Council on Global Change in 2009, atmosphere considers a 2 degrees climate compatible limit which translates into a global budget of 750 gigatons of CO2 for the years 2010 to 2050. For an average world population of 8.2 billion, the resulting yearly individual budget is 2,300 kilograms of CO2. So the flight is considered climate compatible. Using the My Climate Calculator, the carbon footprint of the flight is 772 kilograms of CO2, not far from the atmosphere value. Is this climate compatible? According to the Paris Agreement for Switzerland, the warming limit is 1.5 degrees Celsius. It turns into an annual individual budget of 600 kilograms of CO2 so the impact of the flight is over the climate limit. Additionally, the annual individual budget is now lower than those 600 kilograms of CO2 because it has been exceeded for many years. Of course, different assumptions produce different conclusions. Now, what's your sustainable emissions budget? What's the impact of your flights compared to your sustainable budget? Have a go before you come back. Did you use flight emissions calculators? Did you look at the methods they use? You could conclude that even a rather short distance flight puts the sustainability of your lifestyle at risk. Even if you turn your housing low carbon, eat low carbon and turn your other consumptions low carbon. You now probably realize that flyers, especially frequent flyers, are consuming a global carbon budget. What are the take-home messages from this chapter? If you consider individual sustainable targets, there is not much space for air travel. If you want the carbon impact of air travel to look small, use the following recipe. 1. No sustainable target. Express the impact as a share of real unsustainable impacts. <laughs> 2. Dilute the impact of those who fly among the total impact of billions of inhabitants. <laughs> 3. Limit what's in the results. Only count CO2 emissions as sources of global warming and adopt a narrow scope, including only the flight, not other induced activities. I'm pleased to announce that we are now out of the zone of turbulence and I hope you're recovering. We're going to start our descent flying over a nice landscape of solutions. Aircrafts more fuel efficient than 40 years ago. Do you remember by how much? 70%. Here is the quote from a special report on aviation published in 1999. It's about technical advances on fuel efficiency of aircrafts and compares these points to this one. But this reference point is an aircraft named DH Comet 4 and this first jet airliner was much less fuel efficient than the piston aircrafts produced just before. So, 70% better, yes, but 
the reference is not really relevant. These technical solutions are framed by questions about what transport services you get for a given amount of energy. For aircraft manufacturers, it's for example reducing the mass of the aircraft for a given load, improving the aerodynamics or the engine characteristics to get more out of the fuel. If you think about supersonic aircrafts, of course they could reduce flight times at the expense of increased carbon impacts. So forget them if you dream about low carbon flights. Let's conclude this brief overview of technical solutions with the IKO, I quote, Industry is constrained by having to operate within the unchanged rules of physics. You could also question the sustainability of energy sources. Revolutionary aircraft technologies have been proposed. But anyway, there are no near to midterm solutions, and of course, the lifetime impacts should be calculated. Instead, the IKO described drop in SAFs as promising options. What's that? Drop in means that they can be dropped into ordinary fuels so you don't have to change the engines. SAF stands for Sustainable Aviation Fuel. Sustainable, according to the IKO, means a reduction of the CO2 lifetime emissions compared to conventional aviation fuels by at least 10%. What about deforestation? For the IKO, land deforested before 2008 is not taken into consideration. After 2008, the emissions from deforestation, a category of land use change, are included. Which means that fuels produced on recently deforested land are considered sustainable by the IKO if the resulting carbon impact is less than 90% of the impact of conventional fuels. You may see sustainability differently. Airline management also matters. It influences fuel efficiency. For example, there is a 63% gap between airlines operating transatlantic flights. The fleet matters because it influences the fuel burned by the aircraft. The load factors also matter. They depend on the seat density and on the passenger load factor. Additionally, air traffic management influences the time and the fuel lost when planes wait in the air before landing or on the ground before taking off. Both raise questions about the management of flights. Now let's discuss taxes. There are many taxes on air tickets. Many of them cover services such as airport operations, safety and security. Some of them cover externalities, typically noise. And some taxes on air tickets are not related to air travel. So most of them are not designed to address climate issues. But taxes could answer questions about public policies to address climate change. This slide is about a fictive tax on fuel for a flight from Paris to Marrakesh. From the kilometers and the average fuel consumption of the Lufthansa airline, you get liters per passenger for the round trip. Using the French tax rates for unleaded petrol and diesel fuel, it would be about 100 euros per flight. Then, adding 20% for VAT, 
you get about 120 euros. It's a fictive case because international aviation fuel is usually exempt from both. The EU set up another system to control greenhouse gas emissions, an emissions trading scheme. This scheme is imposed on carbon emitters, initially including fixed sources over a given power in brief large emitters. Of course, aircrafts are not fixed sources. The scheme combines emission permits and markets. Emission permits means that each year emitters are given a carbon allowance, a right to emit a given amount of CO2. Markets means that if they need to emit more, they can buy some right to emit more on markets. The idea is to cap or limit total emissions. In 2012, the EU made an attempt to include aviation in the scheme. But the reactions of non-EU countries, especially the US and China, stopped the plan and it was limited to intra-EU flights. What was the impact of this system on aviation emissions? Let's have a look at a graph from the EU Data Viewer for Aviation and focus on 2017. The emissions, the verified emissions, are 64 million tons of CO2 and they grew. The allowances or rights to emit CO2 were allocated for free or auctioned or sold. The total amount is 37 million tons of CO2. Emissions are superior to allowances by 27 million tons of CO2 and this is possible because the difference was paid for. The EU said it had reduced net emissions of aviation and that it had reduced the carbon footprint of the aviation sector. But you must realize it's not a reduction of physical emissions, it's just payments for emissions reductions by other actors. Carbon cards are similar systems for citizens. You would have an initial carbon credit, the right to emit a given amount of CO2, it would decrease according to the carbon impact of your purchases, which would limit your climate impact, except if credits were tradable. In this case, you could get extra carbon credits from citizens who emit less than their initial allowance by paying for the transfer. It could be a mandatory public policy instrument but presently, when you choose to use a carbon card, it looks like offsetting, which is what I'm going to explain now. Voluntary carbon offsetting takes place through carbon markets and prior allowances are not necessary. On one side of the market, buyers are typically citizens or organizations. They emit CO2 or more generally, they have a warming impact and they would like to do something to reduce the impact of, for example, a flight. On the other side of the market, sellers are typically communities with carbon reduction projects. Each of the projects could reduce CO2 emissions by a given amount and this has a given cost. Between buyers and sellers, Online platforms get funds from the buyers, keep part of the funds for their own management and give the rest to carbon reduction projects. As a result, buyers offset part of their carbon impact and most of them deduce this amount when they calculate their carbon footprint. For example, Air France announced that from 2020 the CO2 emissions of its domestic flights would be offset. As a result, communication is made about carbon-neutral flights. 
The only source of warming is CO2 and the scope is limited to the flight. It covers domestic flights, however, for international flights, for example from Paris to Marrakesh, there is an option for travelers to plant trees. And a footnote honestly informs you about the upstream emissions of the fuel. For the same flight, Atmosphere offers offsetting the flight's climate impact for 21 euros. And you can either let Atmosphere choose one of the ongoing projects or choose a specific project you want to fund. My climate offers offsetting this flight for 20 euros. But you can also choose among options and it's more expensive if half of your funds goes to a Swiss project. The offsetting system by Lufthansa offers you a compensation for 51 euros. But very interestingly, it also offers you to choose what you want between a slow compensation, planting trees which costs less, and a rapid compensation made of sustainable aviation fuels which costs more about the same amount as the fictive taxation hypothesis I developed on slide 47. If you read information on these fuels, you'll see they are slightly different from those mentioned on slide 44. Note that critics have highlighted the possibility that trees planted to offset your emissions could die before they remove the carbon you had emitted especially if dry and warm episodes increase because of climate change. And it's difficult to be sure that the projects you fund would not have been implemented without the funds from offsetting. What can we conclude about markets and allowances? Airlines and other actors on the transport supply side can reduce their own emissions. This has a cost, and another solution may be less expensive, payments through carbon markets. They broaden the emitter's system to include other actors who reduce their own emissions so that this larger system emits less than before. If a permit scheme limits emissions, it's easier to stay under the limit especially if the newly included actor is not covered by the permit scheme. Of course, it would be better not to emit from a climate viewpoint than emit and pay for some reduction of emissions. All this also applies to actors who buy travel services. Trust then becomes the core question, facing statements about reduction of the carbon footprint, or carbon neutrality. If the allowances of permit schemes exceed needs to emit, or if low-cost carbon projects are offered on international carbon markets, such green statements are low-cost but questionable. Now I'm going to say a few words about Corsia, which means Carbon Offsetting and Reduction Scheme for International Aviation. It's a plan from the ICAO aiming at a carbon neutral growth from 2020. What does this mean? The forecast is a growth of international aviation, which would result in a growth of the CO2 emissions if nothing was done. A better airline and traffic management would reduce the growth of these emissions. Technology and norms would reduce the emissions of aircrafts and sustainable aviation fuels already mentioned before would also reduce the growth of emissions. So that the net CO2 emissions would be constant from the baseline years 2019 and 2020. But 2020 is now questioned as a baseline year, 
as the coronavirus pandemic is impeding the planned growth of international aviation. Of course, you could use other transport modes than air travel. If your question is how to minimize the impact of a given trip, you will have to consider the mode itself, its energy source, and above all, the load factor, because air travel is often compared to a car with only one person, while adding passengers divides the impact. You will have to be careful about other impacts than carbon impact to avoid comparison biases. You could also question your traveling rhythm, flying less often for longer stays. Compared to four stays of one week, one stay of four weeks optimizes the ratio between the time spent on the stays and the impact of the trips. You could also change your vision about trips. Instead of time lost traveling, they could add to stays as beneficial moments you get from a given impact. This broadens the frame for your questions and would make slow modes of transport re-emerge as relevant solutions. Of course, only part of these solutions could fit professional needs. For professional needs, flying is not the only answer if the question is how to support professional interactions as information technologies offer a wide range of solutions. By the way, why do people travel abroad? For international travelers, so not only people who fly, the main purpose in blue is leisure, recreation, holidays. The second purpose in yellow is visiting friends and relatives, health, religion and other purposes. The third one in red is business and professional. So let's focus on the main reason. Evasion is one of the arguments used to spread the idea that we need to escape again and again. Escape from prisons? The only question is where and when. Think out of the box. And the question becomes how to transform the prison into a paradise. When you succeed, you no longer think that the words unknown and sublime only apply to distance traveling. You know it applies to your own environment and just feel compassion for those who continue in prisons. You know that flying for leisure doesn't flag anything desirable. It just flags people stuck in a trap who cannot see they could get out of it. What are the take-home messages from this chapter? The present landscape of solutions looks like a patchwork of diversity with holes everywhere. Our inefficiency contrasts with the power of a small coronavirus which not only drastically reduced the carbon impact of air travel, but also put forward the question, fly or not to fly, and made us question many of our needs. We've just landed at the core of the kingdom of human needs, expanding ways beyond the carbon impact of air travel, and I hope you'll enjoy exploring it. If you like this video, turn off your screen, go outdoors and ask yourself which type of aircraft you want to see in the skies.